Are your brushes fraying after use? Are your paint strokes messy, giving you hard lines or blotting? Let's learn to improve our brushwork in part three of my beginner's guide to watercolor. In today's video, I'll be talking about types of brushes and their uses, practice exercises, brush techniques, and brush care. Let's get started. Our brushes come in a large variety, so it can get a little confusing on what to get. There are big brushes, thin brushes, square shaped, rounded, or even fan shaped. When was the last time I used this? To be honest, I have quite the collection of brushes, but I hardly use them because I have found the proper brushes now. I'm not angry, I'm just a little disappointed. So let me help you from making the same mistakes I did. While it is really tempting to buy that value packet with 15 different brushes in it, you will end up using only three at four at most, and they are cheap, they do often shed. When you get brushes, make sure they are watercolor brushes. Acrylic and oil are made with harsher fibers and will not work best for watercolor. Instead, I suggest these as a starter watercolor pack. This is a Zen brush pack from Royal and Lang Nickel. They have a variety of packets, but I suggest the one with these brushes in it. It gives you good sized brushes and they are a little easier to handle as beginners. This one is a flat brush. It is mainly used for washes, which is why it's sometimes referred as a wash paint brush. There are larger sizes available, but this medium size is good for straight lines too and can be used on pieces that have large bodies of water. This is the round wash paint brush, and it can get confused with the mop brush, but this is also used for washes as well. But they hold a lot more water, and you can paint a little more loosely if you like. I like this one for my washes because I don't have to worry about putting down too much paint in my washes. It will be watery, so be careful not to put too much or you'll end up with harsh lines and even unwanted blooms or color flowers as they're called. This is the mop brush. They're usually made with goat hair, so it's able to take up more paint and water. Now, if you're uncomfortable using animal hair products, there are synthetic brushes available. Just be sure to type in synthetic when you're searching for brushes. And while animal hair can hold more water and paint, the difference is very slight and hardly noticeable. Back to the mop brush, this one, again, can be used as a wash, but it's great for smoothing out harsh lines and blending. Be careful not to add too much water. You kind of want to brush away the noticeable lines. Next is this little guy. I originally thought it was a filbert brush, but their fibers are a little longer and are used mainly for wider strokes. Great for florals if you want to try that. But this is a scrubber brush. This is mainly used for lifting paint or fixing mistakes. I don't use this one too much because I fear it will damage the paper, so I use it for its other purpose, blotting or stippling. I painted this piece with a scrubber brush and I love how the marsh turned out. Last but not least is the round brush. This is the brush you have. It's versatile, it's so easy to use, and in most of my paintings, I only use two sizes of round brush, three if I'm using the round wash brush. Depending on how you hold the brush, you can do wide strokes, thin strokes, stippling, blotting. I highly, highly recommend to start your brush collection with some round brushes. I use size six and size four. And there are also tiny round brushes that are mainly used for detail, but they do not hold a lot of water, so you will be refreshing that brush quite a bit. Now, there are other brushes like angle brush, dagger brush, which looks kind of similar, but not the same brush, liner brush, and cat's tongue. <coughs> Don't worry about it, Opie, it's just an oval wash brush. But those brushes are not absolutely needed. If you want to try something different after you've used the brushes I've mentioned, then it will be easier to adapt to them. As of right now though, don't worry about them. Now I have mentioned how the brushes work, but you should definitely try these exercises to get used to them. The purpose of these is to know how much pressure to add to your brush and also know how to work your wrist and arm to make the strokes you want. Take a sheet of watercolor paper. For exercises like this, I use the 90 pound or 190 GSM watercolor paper. It doesn't take paint very well, but for something like this, it will do. Let's wet our round brush and hold it straight up like this. You will be able to make thin lines, so use confident long strokes, and make a few rows like this, and refresh and load the brush again if it starts to get a little streaky. Now I want you to hold the brush like this. Notice how I moved my hand up the handle. This will give me some control in my brush, but not as much as I did and it will give the more fluid look and less stiff. The lines will be thicker, and again, use long, confident strokes. After a few strokes like that, make a few more lines. Same grip, but I want you to apply pressure while making the lines, like this. Very useful when you're making curved or round shapes. And after a few lines of that, we're going to change our grip again to have the handle pointed towards us. And then using the side of the brush, also called the belly, you're going to go side to side like so. See how much paint is laid down. 
This is good if you have wider areas to paint that's too small for a wash brush. Now we're going to flick the brush to make short, thin strokes like blades of grass. Flip the handle away from you and start from the bottom and flick to the top. You can use the wrist to make this motion, but it's not the best method to use as it will tire out your wrist. So instead, use your forearm to make that movement. I know it seems natural to use your wrist, but work towards using your arm instead. Your wrist will thank you. You can even practice stippling with your round brush or scrubber, and you can use the same medium hold like this, or you can try this hold. This grip will give you the least control, but the most fluid strokes. It can be chaotic, but sometimes chaotic can be a good thing. With the round and flat wash brushes, practice with more or less paint. And slow is key here, as you want a nice even wash. With each stroke, you're gonna overlay slightly over that last stroke, which will move some of the paint down to make the wash more even. Now you're warmed up and ready to get started on the piece itself. Take a wet brush, load it with paint, and apply it to the paper. This is probably the most common technique, wet on dry. We are taking a wet brush to a dry piece of paper. This is one of the best to start with as it is the technique with the most control. You are taking the paint where it needs to go. The next technique is wet on wet. You wash the paper first and take a wet brush to it, and you'll notice this blooming effect on your paper. This technique is one of the harder ones because you are letting the water control the spread of the paint. You can work with it, and when working with multiple colors, it can get a little muddy. So use colors that work well together, like green and blue tones, red and blue tones, or orange and yellow. After it dries, you can add details to make it easier to identify the subject of your paintings. Forest pieces are great for this sort of thing. These are the most used techniques I've seen, but there's two more to consider. The first one is dry on wet. This is again letting the water do its work on the paint, but you could control how much. So you take a dry brush, it doesn't have to be bone dry, but somewhat dry, and you're going to scrape off the dry paint from the palette and then apply it. The blooming effect will occur, but it's not as intense as it was on the wet on wet technique. This gives you back some control and a great effect for trees. The last technique is dry on dry. Mainly I use this for texture after letting my piece completely dry. It helps give dimension and it's scratchy so you're not gonna see nice full strokes. But again, it's more like an add-on to your piece. Sand, dirt packs, tree trunks, shadow, it really relates to the viewer that there is some depth in your painting. There are a few more techniques, some using salt or alcohol, but that's for another time. Focus on the four I went over. They are the basis of the watercolor techniques. So you're done with painting for the day and it's time to put everything away. However, you do need to remember to clean your brushes. Otherwise, they will get crusty and wear out sooner. For every day, you need to get that paint out by aggressively swirling your brush in that paint cup. Then you're going to swirl the brush again in the clean water cup. Wipe dry, making sure you keep it in its shape, and place it on something to dry on, like a paper towel or a lint-free rag. Once in a while though, they do need a good cleaning about every couple of months. Fortunately, watercolor brushes are very easy to clean. All you need is mild soap, a lint-free rag, and water. You're going to be gentle. We don't want to deform or damage the brush. Wet your brush and using mild soap, load the brush like you would with paint, like this. Then you're going to twirl the brush, rotating as you go in circles. Do not hold it upright. This will deform the brush. Now run water through it as you're swirling the brush until the water runs clear. Leave them out in a safe place to dry. Do not store away wet brushes. Mildew could form. Remembering to do these things will leave you with long lasting brushes. And that concludes our third part of my beginner guide to watercolor. If you learned something new from this video, or if you have a question, leave a comment below and I'll respond to all of them. Make sure you follow for part four and I'll see you next week.